Hi, thanks for joining me as we look at three things we need to do to be successful. Let's start with Push the Envelope. Songs and recording artists that make a mark, songs that have a profound impact, have something in common with every other art form. Whether it's cinema or painting or literature or dance or theater, art that grabs attention breaks new ground. Picasso, Monet, Andy Warhol, Bach, Beethoven, Frank Lloyd Wright, George Balanchine. You know, any artist that's a household name is not famous because of their technical ability. They're famous because they brought something new to the art form. And that's what we're going to need to do to break through. I'll name some artists. Ella Fitzgerald, Tina Turner, The Beatles, Joni Mitchell, Bjork, Snoop Dogg, Shania Twain. All of them were unique. No one else sounded like them. Good singers, they're a dime a dozen. You can hear them every night on, you know, reality singing show competitions. But it's artistry and a distinctive sound that sets artists apart from singers. And by the way, those songs that they sing play a huge role in establishing their identity. But no matter what your creative medium is, you've got to carve out your own distinctive identity. I'm not suggesting that you manufacture something fake. I'm saying identify part of you that is special and then choose to amplify that aspect to make you stand out from the crowd. I'm going to give you an analogy. There's going to be a contest and the winner, the person who can come up with the best chocolate chip cookie wins a million dollars. Now, all of the cookies submitted are going to come from professional bakers, so they're all going to be delicious. You're going to have to find a new way, something to do to your cookie to make it better or different than all the rest. It's not going to work, by the way, to be sneaky and say, well, I'll make a brownie or I'll make, you know, a piece of fudge. No, no, no. It's a cookie competition. You've got to give them a cookie. You know, what can you do to set yours apart? Maybe you could add macadamia nuts, peanut butter, some colored frosting, some sprinkles on top, maybe pretzel bits, coconut. Hmm, this is starting to sound good. Maybe you could use some white chocolate or marshmallows. But whatever you do, I'm going to promise you an unadorned delicious cookie is not going to win the prize. And it's the same deal with songwriting. I'm not saying that you throw out the envelope. I'm saying you push it. It's still got to be a song that's going to sound consistent with the other songs in its genre. But you've got to find some edge in order to break through. Let's look at some of the ingredients that we can sprinkle into our songs to create recipes for standout hits. Songs that sound fresh and original while still sounding like they fit into their respective genres. Let's start with lyric considerations. Whether the lyric comes first or the melody comes first, when it's time for me to start writing a lyric, I want to build on a foundation of a unique angle, a new way to say the same old thing. If I'm building on a fresh foundation, let me tell you, it makes my job so much easier, I'm already halfway home. The other <laughs> opposite side of that is if I'm trying to build on a predictable, mundane idea that's been heard a million times before, it's really going to be tough to separate my song from the pack. Now, by a unique concept, I'm not talking about something, you know, like writing a song about quantum physics or extolling the uh, virtues of algebra. That's not what I'm talking about. We still need songs that millions of people are going to relate to. Songs that say something that they wish they could say or that they wish they could hear. But we need to find original ways to do that. For example, Britney Spears did not say, you're no good for me. She said, you're toxic. Sam Hunt did not say in his breakthrough song, she's so beautiful. He said, she's got a body like a back road. Then look at Justin Bieber and Dan Shea. They didn't say, I'll do whatever it takes to get to know you. They came up with the angle, I'd spend 10,000 hours and 10,000 more if that's what it takes to learn that sweet heart of yours. For me, 
Building on a great idea is so important, I won't start a song unless I'm sure I've got one. So the same applies, by the way, when crafting the actual lines of lyric. We've got to find new ways to say the same old things, where nobody's going to choose our songs over the competition. I've heard it said, look over your lyric one line at a time and ask yourself, could anybody else have said this this exact same way? If the answer is yes, throw out that line and tweak it, make it just a little bit special, a little bit stronger, where nobody's going to pick yours. I'm not saying to write poetry or lines that are so unusual that they draw attention to themselves in a bad way. In most styles, we still want our lyrics to sound conversational, like something we'd actually say. Now, there are only a limited number of lyric themes that are going to be popular. You know, if you're writing a love song, it's even extra important to find an angle because so many songs are going to be love songs. Now, I'm not suggesting that you create with a whip at your back and the thought that I've got to create something new and exciting. Nobody can do their best work with that kind of pressure. Give yourself permission to create with no censors, no little voice on your shoulder saying, you're not good enough. This song's not good enough. Shut up. Anyway, then go back and revisit your song. Put each line under a microscope and be sure it's a special line. So for each line, ask yourself, is this line good or is it wow? Is this a line that's going to make an artist say, man, I have never heard it said that way before. I've got to cut this song. Let's look at ways to make our melodies sound fresh. We need songs that are going to be catchy and hooky with can't get it out of your brain melodies. To set our melodies apart, we can use elements such as distinctive rhythms within the vocal melody. We can incorporate interesting aspects to the backing tracks. Unexpected musical intervals for the singer to sing. And chord progressions that go beyond the predictable. Can you add an unexpected high note or maybe a low note? Think of the impact that one note can bring to a song when you think about the song, I've Got Friends in Low Places. That one low note, that's the magic. Maybe there's a chord that can add a magic moment to your song. But one way or another, or multiple ways, we need to push the envelopes. Another thing that we can do is to try and blend genres, combine elements from different musical styles to result in songs that really create a new genre. Now, I've got a feeling the next big thing is probably not going to be Chinese opera set to a rap and polka beat. I don't have a good feeling about that. But you can combine genres successfully. Lil Nas X did it with Old Town Road, combining rap and country music to create a hybrid that topped Billboard's Hot 100 for 19 weeks. He used sampled banjos, trap-style bass and drums, and introduced country rap to mainstream pop. Similarly, Ed Sheeran's Shape of You infused pop music with dancehall and tropical house rhythms. Doja Cat's Record of the Year Grammy nominee Say So, it combined 70s sort of disco and funk with a current pop sensibility and turned an unknown artist into a superstar. You know, another thing we can do to separate our songs and create something new is to bring in unexpected instrumentation. Taylor Swift did it with her number one song, Willow, that includes glockenspiel, cello, flute, French horn, violin. You know, we might not have access to those in instruments, but you probably have access to samples of them. She created a sound that broke new ground with that song. Now, I want to point something out. It's not going to do a bit of good to look at successful songs and say, well, that song's not so special. Why is that a hit? If we want hit songs, we're going to have our very best shot if we incorporate concepts, lyrics, melodies, 
rhythms, chords, and production elements that make music industry pros, recording artists, and fans think, wow, I have never heard it done that way before. I am not suggesting that you recreate the wheel. I'm saying explore ways to make your wheel a little bit different and a little bit better than those other wheels. So now, presuming that you've got this awesome song, the next thing you need to do is identify a market for the song. Not all songs have a place in the current marketplace. I want to tell you, at the beginning of my songwriting journey, I spent years writing from the deepest places of my heart. I would light candles and unleash my secrets and my angst to the universe. I wrote whatever I felt, and it felt amazing. That would have been perfect, except I wasn't writing for my own enjoyment. I wanted to sign a publishing deal, a staff writing deal, so I wouldn't have to work any more miserable temp jobs, so I could write songs all day long and get paid for it. I wanted to hear my songs on the radio, and I wanted them to be recorded by artists other than me. But it never crossed my mind that I wasn't writing those kinds of songs. My songs had these deep, abstract lyrics, so shrouded in symbolism, even I didn't understand what I was writing about. The lyrics were these just stream of consciousness ramblings, and whether an audience understood what I was talking about or not never entered my mind. If the title happened to be in the song, that was a lucky coincidence. And by the way, I'm not joking, but we all have to start somewhere. My melodies, they were afterthoughts. I sang whatever came out of my mouth to predict to predictable chord changes that I strummed on my guitar. My melodies never included the melodic or the rhythmic repetition that I now know allows melodies to burn into the brains of our listeners. My melodies were only there to showcase the lyrics, which I thought were more important. And by the way, I was dead wrong. I'm 100% certain now that melody, if I had to pick, melody is more important. Yet, it never even crossed my mind to rewrite a melody back then. I also never thought about what genre I was writing in. Now, looking back, I realize my early songs were what I'd call singer-songwriter songs, but in my case, they were bad singer-songwriter songs. Today, they'd be referred to as Americana or Roots or Contemporary Folk. And by the way, in my opinion, some of the best songs being written today are in those genres. But I envisioned my songs being recorded by artists like Joni Mitchell and Cat Stevens and Bob Dylan. These people were incredible songwriters. They were singer-songwriters. Get it? They were writing their own songs. But it never crossed my mind that the kinds of songs I was writing were the kind of songs that people wrote for themselves. In today's market, the analogy would be like, Imagining that we could get our songs recorded by artists like Jason Isbell, Mary Gaucher, Sturgill Simpson, or Roseanne Cash. These are brilliant songwriters, and they only record their own songs. That's the case for most Americana and Roots artists. They usually write their own songs. In the instances when they don't, it's not that somebody has gone out and pitched them a song. Most of the time, they either hear the song performed at a folk festival or it's on an album by somebody that they admire or somebody plays it for them and says, oh man, you got to hear this song that I love. Publishers rarely represent Americana or folk or roots music because unfortunately, as a rule, that kind of music doesn't generate a lot of income from radio play or sales. The artists in these genres tend to make their money from performing from ticket sales and from merchandise. Now, you might have the perfect song for Adele, Ed Sheeran, Taylor Swift, Beyonce, you know, Nicki Minaj, but in this, at this point in their careers, they are not going to write, uh, they're not going to perform or record a song that they didn't write. And that's the case for most pop artists. 
It's also the case for rock and hip hop and alternative rock. It's, it's just incredibly hard to get any of these kind of artists to record a song they didn't write. The genres that have the highest percentage of artists recording songs that we call outside songs, meaning songs the artist didn't write, are country and Christian music. About 30% of the songs in those styles are not written or co-written by the artists. Now, that still means that 7 out of 10 country and Christian songs are inside jobs. But at least you've got a 3 out of 10 chance in those styles. You don't have anywhere near those odds in the other genres. So what do you do if you're writing the kind of songs that artists write for themselves? Or songs that just don't fit on today's charts? Well, first thing you need to do is write amazing songs. Notice, I did not say good songs. I did not say perfectly crafted songs. I'm talking about songs with melodies and lyrics that would make an artist choose yours out of a pile of a thousand songs. Songs that would make them bump ten songs that they wrote because they would say, oh my god, this song is incredible. That's not going to be easy to do. But you know what? People do it. And it's a lot easier to do it if you push yourself there than if you just hope it comes out naturally. At least that's the case for me. Then, once you've got those killer songs and you've got really good recordings of them, you align with a music publisher who has the clout and the credibility to connect you to co-write with recording artists. Sometimes that's going to mean that the publisher takes one of your existing songs to an artist and then that artist becomes a co-writer by changing elements of the song so that it really fits them, so that it feels like the words come from their heart and the melodies are something that feel natural for them. Now, wasn't that easy? All I've asked you to do is write a freaking amazing song and then sign with a publisher. To be clear, Signing with a publisher is no easy task. It's right up there with saying, I'm going to be a movie star. That's what I'll do. But if you write songs that go beyond good, songs that really push the boundaries while still sounding like smash hits, and you take care of business, you're going to have a good shot at grabbing a publisher's ears. They need amazing songs. So another option if you're writing songs that might not seem like the kind of songs you can get an artist to record, is sync licensing. Sync, S-Y-N-C, is short for synchronization, and it refers to placing songs in TV shows, movies, and in video games. So, to do this, you're going to need to control all the rights to the song and all the rights to the recording of the song. If you have co-writers, they've all got to be on board, and you need permission from every singer, every musician, and the producer, if there is one, to use their performances in TV or film. Um, there is a form called a Musician and Vocalist's Waiver that you can find in my book, This Business of Songwriting, which is available at Amazon, and there's also a downloadable version of that contract that comes with uh, my audio lecture, Writing and Placing Songs in TV and Film, which is available at my website. And that includes our commercial. I should say concludes our commercial. The performances and the sonic quality of the recordings you pitch for sync licensing need to be very high because in most cases, what you submit is the actual recording that will go into the TV show or the movie. They don't re-record it, unless it's going to be something like the end credit song in a big Hollywood movie, or the theme song for a TV show, or the, you know, the song that plays over the end credits of a big TV show. But most of the songs, or the music, including background instrumental music, that we can place in TV shows and movies tends to be used in the background. For example, Songs that are coming out of a jukebox when somebody goes into a bar. Or the song we hear when somebody puts on headphones and they're bopping down the street. 
or maybe the song that we hear when somebody switches on their car radio and they're driving down the highway in a scene. At my workshops, I sometimes hear songs that sound like they be belong in a different era, like they could have been hits for maybe the Beatles or Patsy Cline or George Jones or Elvis or Sinatra. Listen, I don't know how to break it to you. But most of those artists are dead. I'm so sorry. And the kind of songs they sang, those are not on the radio today. If you write songs that sound like they're from a different era, TV and film is probably going to be your only outlet unless you have a time machine. So bear in mind, there are only a relatively small number of songs set in a different time period. I'm sorry, I should say a small number of movies and TV shows set in a different time period that need songs from those time periods to evoke the sense of that era. But there are some. Now, inevitably, when I hear a sad, depressing, slow, introspective song at one of my workshops, and I ask the writers, what's your vision for this song? What do you plan to do with it? 100% of the time I get the answer, television and film. Well, theoretically, it's true that there could be a place for any kind of music in the right scene in a TV show or a movie, for instance. If you've got a movie set in, you know, Africa, that we might need jungle drums, probably will. If you're in Scotland, there's going to need back, bagpipe music. And if you're at a funeral, they're probably going to need some sad, slow music. But the vast majority of the songs that wind up on screen sound more like current radio hits than the deep, dark, sad songs that people think are perfect for sync licensing. So some of the most successful songs in sync licensing express positive ideas like, we can do this, or from now on everything's going to be great, or I'm so happy. These are some of the most syncable ideas that you can write. And we could probably all happily retire from the money earned from sync licensing by I'm Walking on Sunshine by Katrina and the Waves. Get This Party Started by Pink. I Got a Feeling, Black Eyed Peas. And Justin Timberlake's I'm Loving It for the McDonald's commercials. You know, there are no rules. And there are always exceptions. So you could point to Sarah McLaughlin's Angel Song. It's used to raise money and awareness against animal cruelty in those commercials that tear my heart out. But for every one of those kinds of songs that's used on TV and film, you could probably find at least 25 more that are positive, upbeat songs. When it's done well, you don't even notice the music that's in the background on TV. Unless it's our songs. I, I notice that. But if you start listening really closely, and jot down the description of the musical style and the lyrical concepts you hear in your favorite TV shows and movies, it's really going to give you a better sense of the kind of music that you can likely place. So to summarize, if your goal is commercial success, meaning monetizing your music, you need to write the kind of music that has a place in the current marketplace, and you need to know where it fits. It is awesome to write for your own enjoyment and your own catharsis. I recommend it. But the problem comes when we fail to differentiate those kinds of songs from the ones that we can place with current hit artists and with music publishers. So. I spent years so frustrated writing songs that I thought were better than the crap on the radio. And everything changed when I recognized if I want my songs to be on the radio, I need to write songs that are consistent with the songs on the radio and not the kind of songs that the artists were writing for themselves. And the same applies when I was writing for television and film. Then I had a decision to make. Was I writing solely for my own satisfaction or did I want to be 
a professional songwriter. And I'm going to tell you what I learned. I found out I could write songs that were born in my heart, but were crafted and steered to a place where they fit really well besides the hits of the day. So that brings me to my third and final thing that we've got to do to be successful. We've got to be persistent. Nothing trumps the ability to persevere through the challenges and the inevitable disappointments that are woven into the music business. There are countless stories of songs and recording artists that took years before becoming iconic. You might have heard my story of moving to LA, certain that I would have a Mercedes in my driveway in one year. And it actually only took me two weeks because I got a job driving rich people's Mercedes to the car wash and picking up their dry cleaning and watering their plants. But I only worked 15 hours a week, so I could devote a thousand percent of my energy to learning how to write songs and to writing them and to recording them. I lived in one room, no kitchen, the bathroom was down the hall, and I shared it with the junkies, the hookers, the mice, and the cockroaches that lived in my building. And it's true that when I only had 11 cents and I was really hungry, I bought cat food and I ate that. And yes, kitty tuna became a regular part of my diet. <coughs> I'm sorry, I have a fur ball. Kidding, boom boom. But I'm not kidding that that is a true story. And FYI, I didn't even have a cat back then. Sometimes people hear that story and they'll tell me, oh, that must have been so awful. Wrong. I was happy because I was doing what I wanted. I was following my dream and I was 100% sure I would have a hit and a Mercedes of my own anytime now. So I took every class there was, and there's a lot of classes in LA. Seven years after I arrived, I had my first song recorded. So much for being an overnight success. It went up to number 63 on the Billboard country charts. Did not earn a whole lot of money, but it was performed at the Grand Ole Opry and on other TV shows. And in a moment, I will never forget, I was driving down Ventura Boulevard and my song came on the radio. I'm sure people in other cars heard me screaming. It was an incredible moment. I hope you get that. That song led to every single thing in my career. At the urging of a publisher, I rewrote that song seven times and I did seven demos. I wonder what would have happened if after the third or the fourth rewrite, I'd said, oh no, I'm sick of this. I love it the way it is. I'm not changing it anymore. What's he know? I don't even know if I'd be on this side of the screen. I don't want to take that chance. Hanging in is critical, but it's not going to help if you keep doing things that are stopping your work from being the best it can be. I think it's critical to get trusted professional feedback on your work and stay open to changing things. You can always go back to the way it was if you don't like it. Creative artists, on a rare occasion, find success quickly. It happens uh, about as often as hitting the Powerball in the lottery. But there are some examples of people who really had to hang in there against all odds. You know, Stephen King's horror classic, Carrie, that was turned into the movie, that was turned down by more than 80 publishers. There were countless authors and painters who were never appreciated when they first did their work. Al Edgar Allan Poe, Emily Dickinson, Van Gogh, Monet. It took a long time for them to get recognized. Remember Whitney Houston's first number one single, Saving All My Love For You? It turned her into a superstar. But that song was released on an album by Marilyn McCoo and Billy Davis Jr. of The Fifth Dimension, and it took seven more years before Whitney Houston had the hit with it that saved her life. <laughs> saved her life, I'm sorry, changed her life. Maybe it saved it too back then. What a sad story. But anyway, so after that song was written, 
and it was such an incredible song. It took more than seven years and a stiff recording before the song got recognized. In 1958, the late Bill Mack wrote a song called Blue. You probably remember it. He says he wrote it in 15 minutes. You know, talk about an overnight success. It took 38 years before Leanne Rimes' recording of Blue earned a Grammy for Country Song of the Year. Susan Boyle was 47 before she got on Britain's Got Talent. Michael Bolton, wait to hear this, he began his career as a heavy metal artist. In 1975, he opened shows for Ozzy Osbourne. It took 13 years from the time he released his first album until he found multi-platinum success with the soulful sound that we all think of him with. The song Bless the Broken Road by Rascal Flatts. Ten years to get to the charts. Miranda Lambert was turned down when she auditioned for Nashville Star the first time. And country superstar Luke Combs, he never passed the audition for The Voice. What if Miranda Lambert and Luke Combs had said, man, this is too tough, I'm giving up. You know, what if Susan Boyle had said, I am too old for this? What if the writers and publishers of Saving All My Love For You and Bless the Broken Road and countless others had given up before success found them? There are countless stories like these and they all have one common denominator. The writers or the recording artists, the authors, the publishers, the painters, they all had the tenacity to persevere through countless rejections. We, are, we have to have, you know, the tender open heart of an artist with the skin of an armadillo. So hang in there and enjoy the journey. Enjoy the writing, the process. My father always used to say to me, how long are you going to give this nonsense? You can't do this forever. And I'd tell him, you know, you're right, Dad. I can't do it forever. If I'm not successful in a hundred years, I'm going to give up and go back to school. I had no plan B. I was determined to make it no matter how long it took. And it took a while. It was 11 years after I moved to LA before I signed a staff writing deal and earned a living as a songwriter. And I wasn't much of a living, but God, I was living my dream and I was loving it. Five and a half years later, for a total of 16 years after I moved to LA, the stars lined up and I wound up with singles on Billboard's pop, R&B, and country charts all at the same time. In fact, I actually had two songs on the country charts at the same time, but who's counting? Um, of course, I didn't have me to study with. Hopefully I can shave a few years off of your journey. And I can do that hopefully with my audio lessons and my books and my workshops. Before I close, I hate to say this, but you wouldn't believe how many songs get sent to me. I totally understand wanting it so badly and thinking I've got to reach out to anybody who might be able to help me. I get it, believe me. But I can only listen to and comment on songs that come through my workshops or when my schedule allows me to do private critiques. I hope you'll check out my magazine article, I Know I've Got a Great Song, Now What? It's there with more than a hundred other magazine articles that are just packed full of really important information that can help you. They're all at my website, jasonbloom.com, and they're all free. Let me end by saying, we've been given a gift. Most people don't conjure up melodies and lyrics in their brains. Take your gift and hone it. Polish it like the precious gem that it is. Push the creative envelope. Identify the market for your work and keep on keeping on. I can't guarantee success, but I know it's possible because six of my students have had number one singles and I can't even count the number of them that signed publishing deals and have had songs on TV and on, you know, in movies. So with hard work and tenacity, 
I have seen people accomplish quote unquote impossible things. And I hope with all my heart I can add you to that list. Thank you for letting me be part of your creative journey. Good luck.